Hello, my amazing children. This is Grandma Carla back with more Christmas stories. Ten Tales of Christmas collected by Lynn G. Miller quite some time ago. And we're reading old stories. And right now we're going to have a poem called December by Eileen Fisher. And this one was 1946, I believe. And... It's a poem. December. I like days with snow white collar and nights when the moon is a silver dollar and hills are filled with elder down stuffing and your breath makes smoke like an engine puffing. I like days when feathers are snowing and all the eaves have petticoats showing and the air is cold and wires are humming, but you feel all warm with Christmas coming. By Eileen Fisher. Now we're going to read a story called The Christmas Horses. And this story is by Laura Ingalls Wilder. And it was published so basically, this was part of her book, On the Banks of Plum Creek, copyright 1937, and it was from chapter 12 and 13 of that book. But then the, um, the story was pulled out in by the Harper and Brothers, and they renewed the copyright in 1964. So let's read The Christmas Horses. Thanksgiving was past, and it was time to think of Christmas. Still, there was no snow and no rain. The sky was gray, the prairie was dull, and the winds were cold. But the cold winds blew over the top of the dugout. Lara and Mary knew that Santa Claus could not come down a chimney when there was no chimney. One day, Mary asked Ma how Santa Claus could come. Ma did not answer. Instead, she asked, what do you girls want for Christmas? She was ironing. One end of the ironing board was on the table and the other on the bedstead. Pa had made the bedstead that high on purpose. Carrie was playing on the bed, and Laura and Mary sat at the table. Mary was sorting quilt blocks, and Laura was making a little apron for the rag doll, Charlotte. The wind howled overhead and whined in the stovepipe, but there was no snow yet. Laura said, I want candy. So do I, said Mary, and Carrie cried, candy. And a new winter dress, and a coat, and a hood, said Mary. So do I, said Lara, and a dress for Charlotte. And Ma lifted the iron from the stove and held it out to them. They could test the iron. They licked their fingers and touched them quicker than quick to the smooth hot bottom. If it crackled, the iron was hot enough. Thank you, Mary and Lara, Ma said. She began carefully ironing around and over the patches on Pa's shirt. Do you know what Pa wants for Christmas? They did not know. Horses, Ma said. Would you girls like horses? Laura and Mary looked at each other. I only thought, Ma went on, if we all had wished for horses and nothing but horses, then maybe, Laura felt queer, horses were every day. They were not Christmas. If Pa got horses, he would trade for them. Laura could not think of Santa Claus and horses at the same time. Ma, she cried, there is a Santa Claus, isn't there? Of course there's a Santa Claus, said Ma. She set the iron on the stove to heat again. The older you are, the more you know about Santa Claus, she said. You are so big now, you know. He can't just can't be just one man, don't you? You know he is everywhere on Christmas Eve. He is in the big woods and in Indian Territory and far away in New York State. And here he comes down all the chimneys at the same time. You know that, don't you? Yes, Ma, said Mary and Lara. Well, said Ma. Then you see, I guess he's like angels, Mary said slowly. 
and Lara could see that just as well as Mary could. Then Ma told them something else about Santa Claus. He was everywhere, and besides that, he was all the time. Wherever anyone was unselfish, there was Santa Claus. Christmas Eve was the time when everybody was unselfish. One that On that one night, Santa Claus was everywhere because everybody altogether stopped being selfish and wanted other people to be happy. And in the morning, you saw what that had done. If everybody wanted everybody else to be happy all the time, then would it be Christmas all the time? Laura asked, and Ma said, yes, Laura. Laura thought about that. So did Mary. They thought that they lo- as they looked at each other, and they knew what Ma wanted them to do. She wanted them to wish for nothing but horses for Pa. They looked at each other again, and they looked away quickly as they did not say anything. Even Mary, who was always so good, did not say a word. That night after supper, Pa drew Lara and Mary close to him in the crook of his arms. Lara looked up at his face and then she snuggled against him and said, Pa, what is it, little half pint of sweet cider? Pa asked and Lara said, Pa, I want Santa Claus to bring. What? Pa asked. Horses, said Lara, if you will let me ride them sometimes. So do I, said Mary, but Lara had said it first. Pa was surprised. His eyes shone soft and bright at them. Would you girls really like horses, he asked them. Oh, yes, Pa, they said. In that case, said Pa, smiling, I have an idea that Santa Claus will bring us all a fine team of horses. That settled it. They would not have any Christmas, only horses. Lara and Mary soberly undressed and soberly buttoned up their nightgowns and tied on their nightcap strings. They knelt down together and said, Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And please bless Pa and Ma and Carrie and everybody and make me a good girl forever and ever. Amen. Quickly, Lara added in her own head, And please make me only glad about the Christmas horses forever and ever. Amen. Again. She climbed into bed and almost right away she was glad. She thought of horses sleek and shining and how their manes and tails blew in the wind, how they picked up their sweet feet and sniffed the air with velvety noses and looked at everything with bright soft eyes and Pa would let her ride them. Pa had tuned his fiddle, and now he set it against his shoulder. Overhead, the wind went wailing lonely in the cold dark. But in the dugout, everything was snug and cozy. Bits of firelight came through the seams of the stove and twinkled on Ma's steel knitting needles and tried to catch Pa's elbow. In the shadows, the bow was dancing. On the floor, Pa's toe was tapping, and the merry music hid the lonely crying of the wind. Next morning, snow was in the air. Hard bits of snow were leaping and whirling in the howling wind. Lara could not go out to play. In the stable, Spot and Pete and Bright stood all day long, eating the hay and straw. In the dugout, Pa mended his boots while Ma read to him again the story called Millbank. Mary sewed and Lara played with paper dolls. She could let Lara, Carrie, hold Charlotte, but Carrie was too little to play with paper dolls. She might tear one. That afternoon, when Carrie was asleep, Ma beckoned Mary and Lara. Her face was shining with a secret. They put their heads close to hers and she told them, they could make a button string for Carrie's Christmas. They climbed into their bed and turned their backs to Carrie and spread their laps wide. Ma brought them her button box. The box was almost full. Ma had saved buttons since she was smaller than Lara and she had buttons her mother had saved when her mother was a little girl. There were blue buttons and red buttons, silvery and goldy buttons, curved in buttons with tiny raised castles and bridges and trees on them, and twinkling jet buttons, painted china buttons, striped buttons, buttons like juicy blackberries, and even one tiny dog head button. Lara squealed when she saw it. Shh, ma shushed her, but Carrie did not wake up. 
Ma gave them all these buttons to make a button string for Carrie. After that, Laura did not mind staying in the dugout. When she saw the outdoors, the wind was driving snowdrifts across the bare, frozen land. The creek was ice, and the willow tops rattled. In the dugout, she and Mary had their secret. They played gently with Carrie and gave her everything she wanted. They cuddled her and sang to her and got her to sleep whenever they could. Then they worked on the button string. Mary had one end of the string and Laura had the other. They picked out the buttons they wanted and strung them on the string. They held the string out and looked at it and took off some of the buttons and put on others. Sometimes they took every button off and then started again. They were going to make the most beautiful button string in the whole world. One day, Ma told them that this was the day before Christmas. They must finish the button string that day. They could not get Carrie to sleep. She ran and shouted, climbed on benches and jumped off and skipped and sang. She did not get tired. Mary told her to sit still like a little lady, but she wouldn't. Laura let her hold Charlotte and she jounced Charlotte up and down and flung her against the wall. Finally, Ma cuddled her and sang. Laura and Mary were perfectly still. Lower and lower, Ma sang, and Carrie's eyes blinked until they shut. When softly Ma stopped singing, Carrie's eyes popped open, and she shouted, More, Ma, more! But at last, she fell asleep. Then quickly, quickly, Laura and Mary finished the button string. Ma tied the ends together for them. It was done. They could not change one button more. It was a beautiful button string. That evening after supper, when Carrie was sound asleep, Ma hung her clean little pair of stockings from the table edge. Laura and Mary in their nightgown slid the button string into one stocking. Then that was all. Mary and Laura were going to bed when Pa asked them, aren't you girls going to hang your stockings? But I thought, Laura said, I thought Santa Claus was going to bring us horses. Maybe he will, said Pa, but little girls always hang up their stockings on Christmas Eve, don't they? Laura did not know what to think, neither did Mary. Ma took two clean stockings out of the clothes box and Pa helped hang them beside Carrie's. Laura and Mary said their prayers and went to sleep, wondering, in the morning, Laura heard the fire crackling. She opened one eye the least bit and saw a lamplight and a bulge in her Christmas stocking. She yelled and jumped out of bed. Mary came running too, and Carrie woke up. In Laura's stocking and in Mary's stocking, there were little paper packages just alike, and the packages were candy. Laura had six pieces and Mary had six. They had never seen such beautiful candy. It was too beautiful to eat. Some pieces were like ribbons bent in waves. Some were short bits of round stick candy and on their flat ends were colored flowers that went all the way through. Some were perfectly round and striped. In one of Carrie's stockings were four pieces of that beautiful candy and the other was the button string. Carrie's eyes and her mouth were perfectly round when she saw it. Then she squealed and grabbed it and squealed again. She sat on Pa's knee and looked at her candy and her button string and wriggling and laughing with joy. Then it was time for Pa to do the chores. He said, do you suppose there is anything for us in the stable? Said Ma, and Ma said, dress as fast as you can, girls, and you can go to the stable and see what Pa finds. It was a winter. It was winter, so they had to put on their stockings and shoes. But Ma helped them button up the shoes, and she pinned their shawls around their chins. They ran out into the cold. Everything was gray, except a long red streak in the eastern sky. Its red light shone on the patches of gray-white snow. Snow was caught in the dead grass on the walls and the roof of the stable, and it was red. Pa stood waiting in the stable door. He laughed when he saw Lara and Mary, and he stepped outside to let them go in. There, standing in Pete's and Bright's places, were two horses. They were larger than Pete and than Pet and Patty, and they were a soft brown color, shining like silk. Their manes and tails were black. Their eyes were bright and gentle. They put their velvety noses down to Lara and nibbled softly 
at her hand and breathe warm on it. Well, flutter budget, said Pa and Mary, how do you girls like your Christmas? Very much, Pa, said Mary, but Laura could only say, oh, Pa. Pa's eyes shone deep and he asked, who wants to ride the Christmas horses to water? Laura could hardly wait while he lifted Mary up and showed her how to hold on to the mane and told her not to be afraid. Then Pa's strong hand swung Laura up. She sat on the horse's big, gentle back and felt its aliveness carrying her. All outdoors was glittering now with sunshine on snow and frost. Pa went ahead, leading the horses and carrying his axe to brace, break the ice in the creek so that they could drink. The horses lifted their heads and took deep breaths and whooshed the cold out of their noses. Their velvety ears pricked forward, then back, and then forward again. Laura held to her horse's mane and clapped her shoes together and laughed. Pa and the horses and Mary and Laura were all happy in the gay, cold Christmas morning. By Laura Ingalls Wilder in 1937. So let's look at the pictures. Okay, I think there's only... Pictures of the two horses that they got for Christmas. That was a really good Christmas present, wasn't it? I hope you're enjoying these stories as much as I am. This is Grandma Carla, and I love you.